Good morning, Springs. How's everybody? Man, so glad you guys are with us. You know, uh, we were finishing out the series, Lines in the Sand. And these have been lines that we've drawn, that we've said, these, this is what are, we're committed to. The, these were our values. And, uh, and, you know, and we make small shifts in our lives. You know, like we say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I'm going to change this habit or I'm going to... And I'd made one of those recently because I, I had a, kind of like a routine. I, I get to the office early. And uh, so I'm driving in. I normally went to my favorite fast food place and grabbed a, uh, a burrito. And uh, it was $1.49. It, it was a good deal. And I, I did that for years. And I noticed that my burrito started looking more like a flat meatball <laughs> wrapped in tortilla. Hey, I mean, have you noticed how things have gotten smaller, right? And they're more expensive. And uh, well, that, that's what was happening. I'm like, it, it went from a four biter to a two biter, you know? And I said, you know, and they were out one day. So I went by Starbucks and I ordered one of theirs that uh, they don't call it a burrito, but it's a burrito. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, this thing was massive. And it was, I mean, I, now it was six bucks. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I made the switch. Uh, I started going to Starbucks. And, uh, and now for me, that's a really big deal. Some of you, you live there and I get it. Um, but the thing about Starbucks is it, it's intimidating to me. Because if I walk into Starbucks, I don't know why, but everybody looks very serious there. <laughs> Right there, there. Even the people come up to the line, and and they speak Starbuckian. <laughs> right? They they just w when they order drinks, I'm like, I want to stay around just to see what it looks like. <laughs> and uh, they're like, they, this is the like they'll say, Hey, give me a tall non-fat latte with a caramel drizzle. I'm like, Really? I mean, that sounds like a dessert. But, but then, and I've never heard anybody order a, give me a, a tall, fat latte, right? I've just never heard that. I don't even know what all that stuff means, but I've heard them use, you know, skinny and non-fat. And then this is a real drink. A venti iced skinny hazelnut macchiata with sugar-free syrup, extra shot, light ice, no whip. You, now, you got to understand, if you order drinks like that, I'm really happy for you. But I grew up in a generation that we had two choices, caffeinated or decaf. <laughs> and, and so all of these creations, but, but you know, Saddleback, uh, Saddleback, woo, Starbucks has, uh, I'm back, Starbucks has, has built an industry on this, giving you what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. And it's kind of a snapshot of our culture, right? That's uh, the, because you and I, we want what we want, when we want it and how we want it. And it's a, uh, I mean, because we're, we're a very self-focused society. Yeah, I don't want to hurt your feelings early, but you're self-centered. And so am I. It, we live in this self-centered society. Matter of fact, I did, I went on Google and I did a search for uh, self-centeredness and it kicked back 386 million website hits. And, and I started looking through the different categories of all the articles and, and it, it was everything, dozens of topics from you know, self-awareness to self-confidence to self-determination, self-control, self-help. You know, you got self-image, your self-indulgence, you've got self-reliance and self-respect and it just kept going on and on and on. And, you know, we're, we're used to living, getting what we want. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy uh, and he gave Timothy, Timothy was, you know, it, it was his son in the faith. And, and Paul gave him this warning in 
2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. That sounds like a description of the American society today. Doesn't it? I mean, you, you read the media and you're like, I always ask Teddy, I said, is everybody taking crazy pills? Like, wh what's going on? And, and yet, you know, Paul begins it with people will love only themselves and their money. And, you, but here's the thing. You, you and I were born that way. Like we came out of the womb, man. It was all about us. I mean, that, it, too bad we couldn't appreciate how good we had it back then, right? Somebody feeding you, somebody taking care of you, bathing you. I mean, it's like, I don't have to do anything. And, and yet the first word that a child speaks is no. Now, I know some of you say, mommy, daddy, it's because you coach them. That's the only reason. <laughs> the, the natural word that you didn't have to coach is no. And, uh, you know, they, they, because, and actually psychologists say that this is a really healthy and a good fa phase for kids because, you know, that, that, that word no helps them draw boundaries and autonomy for themselves. They're making statements. And I, and actually, I think the psychologists that determined that actually didn't have any kids. Uh, because there's no parent on the planet that thinks that was a good stage, right? And, but then the second word is, you know, it's, it's when they start interacting with others. And, and it's mine, right? If you're playing with a toy and some other kid grabs it, man, they, they say that with passion. This is mine. It's like the most popular word in preschool right now. You know, kids are fighting them. That's my toy. Actually, it's neither of your toys. It was here when you came here. It'll be here when you leave. But, <laughs> but, it's, but, but they do. We, we have those, those battles and we say, you know, it's my stuff, my room, my food. And this form of self-expression was with us from toddlers forward. And I think, honestly, many adults go to their graves with it still being their favorite word. This is mine. This is, this is my money. This is my house. This is my car. This is my life. It's mine. And they never lose the death grip on it. And, and so today, we, we, I know we tend to live a me first life. And I get that. I want to challenge that today. I, I want to challenge you to look at your life and think, what would it be like if you flipped the switch from a me life, me first life to a God first life? Where we really thought through that, what would that look like? And a lot of people, you know, when, when we talk about our core values, one of our values, and this is kind of the lens I want to look at it through, is uh, God is honored in excellence. And, uh, and there, you know, the, the, the God first life is woven through many of our values, but the lens I want to look at it through is that God is honored in excellence. And because, you know, when you put God first, it, you, you know, you're choosing to follow God. And, and that's, and really when you, when you think about that value, a lot of people go, and we actually got pushback on that value when we first sat down and chose it almost 30 years ago. People said, no, no, I mean, excellence, that's perfection, that's opulence, that's, and then we said, no, it, it's not. And, and actually, uh, you know, some people thought, well, excellence is perfection. Excellence is, means superiority, being better than anybody else. I said, no, no, that's success. Not excellence. See, success means being the best, but excellence means being your best. Success means uh, being better than everyone else, but excellence means being better tomorrow than you are today. 
And it's, uh, and so with all of that, we have to, first thing in your life and in mine, we have to redefine excellence. What does that mean for us? How do we, you know, because excellence is not perfection. Excellence is not a destination. You'll never arrive. Excellence is a journey in your life. And, you know, at the Springs, we had to redefine it early on. And we, we say excellence is this, doing the best you can with what you have. And that, you know, that means for us, uh, we, you know, we said, okay, in 1994 when we started, excellence for us was, you know, we didn't have the big screens and everything. We, I mean, we had, we had an overhead projector with transparencies. Some of you remember those, right? We're, and, and my two sons flipping the words for the worship song on the transparencies. It was cutting edge. And, <laughs> but, but it was excellence for us because it was doing the best we could with what we had. And, and what does that mean? I mean, excellence looks so different than it did in 1994 for us because excellence is this moving target because excellence itself the root word is excel. That means you and I, if we're going to live lives of excellence, we have to excel. We have to advance. We have to grow. We have to develop. And, and what does that look like in your faith? See, we serve an excellent God. I mean, I love the Psalm, Psalm uh, 8 verse 1 says, Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth, you have set your glory in the heavens. And, and some translations say, how excellent is your name. And you think about God. I mean, if you were grading God on our grading scale, like in school, go back there. <clears throat> some of you, it's a bad memory. And I understand that. <clears throat> but A means what? I'll be back with you in just a second. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get many of those, but excellent. B means good. C means average. D means done. <laughs> Did for me. But, but you know, but it's that, that excellence. So how would you grade God when you look at how excellent God is? I mean, just grade him on creation, how he flung this whole thing into existence. I mean, the stars, the canopy of stars at night, the, I mean, the creation of the mountains and the oceans and, and humanity. Man, when you look around, it's like you, you th think about it. I mean, God, I, you get an A. I mean, it's excellent, right? The, I mean, if you go to the Grand Canyon, and Niagara Falls, the Great Barrier Reef, and you're like, man, I mean, you can't, God is an A. He's, he's a God of excellence. And you know what? You and I are created in his image. That means we're, we're to live that life of, okay, we're, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. We're going to get better. We're going to excel. We're going to grow in our faith. What does that mean? Excellence always requires giving God your best. You see that written through the pages of scripture. That means you and I have to choose to live a uh, a God first life. It, that's the choice of priorities in your life. Howard Hendricks, great Bible teacher said, the secret of concentration is elimination, which means when you choose something, you have to lose something. When something becomes more important in your life, then something has to become less important. I mean, that's a hard thing about choices, but you, you know, so you're going to make the choice. Yes, I want to live a God first life. And, and, you know, it, here's the ground rule for that, that God first, it's like, okay, I've got to, I've got to put God first in every quadrant, every area of my life. What does that mean? What does that look like? Let me put it to you this way. Wherever you want God's blessing and favor and activity in your life, put him first there. It changes everything. You know, and it's like God first in your time. In your time. 
That means every day, God, you get the first. You, you know, the, spending time with God every day. God, I'm going to begin my day when my feet hit the ground thinking about you and thanking you for another gift of another day. And I'm going to spend time in your word and I'm going to pray. And I'm, I, you, you're giving God first, first and best in your life. This is the whole Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. God says first, make me priority. God first in your week. Like, and you know, that's worship. That's what we're here today. And it's like, when you think about God first, it's an interesting thing in, in our world and in our mind, Sunday's kind of the last day of the week, right? Because we're getting ready for Monday. And we think Monday's like, kind of like the first day, but this is the first day of the week. Give God the first of your week. And you know, when it comes to, to worship, that, that means worship is a priority. It's not an option. It means it matters that much to me. Let me ask you a question. Is worship something that you attend or something you do? Is, is worship, uh, are, are you a spectator or are you a participant watching people worship? You know, and because worship shifts everything in our heart and soul. I, I think about the passages in scripture of, uh, in Matthew 26 and in John, and actually in all the gospels, there's an account similar of Jesus was at a party. And I mean, the, the people on the list, the invite list, I mean, it was like, it was people like Lazarus, he raised from the dead. And it was like Simon who he healed from leprosy. And I mean, it was like the who's who of Jesus moments. And into that party walks a woman who wasn't invited. And while everything's going on, all the noise, all the activity, all the celebration, she walks up to Jesus with an alabaster vial of perfume that was worth a year's wages. That was an heirloom to her. It was passed on from mother to daughter. And she walked up to Jesus and she broke it open and she kneeled down as he he was reclined eating dinner and she poured it over his feet. And, and as soon as she did that, the fragrance filled the room. And the, some of the disciples started complaining, what is she doing? Do you know what we could do with that money? That's a year's wages, what a waste. And then she, she, she lost herself in that moment. Nothing else was going on. It was her and Jesus. This was worship. And she lost her, her dignity in that moment because she let her hair down and she wiped his feet with her hair. Women didn't let their hair down in New Testament times. She was lost in the moment. She was worshiping. That, that's what, do you come prepared to that? that I'm coming before a holy God. I'm worshiping. Him, I'm in his presence. Does everything else fade away? That, give God the first in your week. It will change your week. And God first in your marriage. You know, is, is he the center of your marriage or is he just something you do on Sundays with your uh, spouse? In, in your family, God, you're first. I'm gonna give you first. Guys, don't be the guy that your wife has to guilt you and drag you to church. Lead. Because I'm gonna tell you, there's not a woman on the planet that I know that would not follow a man that was following Jesus. And that, so be that, man, that, 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 that radically changes your marriage and your family. And God first, God first in your finances. It, make him the priority. God first is this huge principle in God's eye from the Old Testament to today. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, most of you don't have barns and vats, but you have bank accounts and investments, right? It's like, it's like God's saying, 
bring me your first. The first fruits is the principle of first fruits. Old Testament times, most people were farmers. They raised animals, they grew crops for a living. So they said, God was saying, I want to be first in your finances. They brought the firstborn. They brought the first and the best. They trusted, they, they brought it to God. And God's saying, first is a priority decision. What you spend money on first determines your priority in life. It does. It's like, uh, you, you're going to take care of this first. And, uh, and Jesus is the one that said, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. I mean, in Matthew 6, 21, and Jesus says, I, if you want to know what's first in your life, check your checkbook, you know, or your statement, right? It's like, okay, that's it. Because there's a connection between your relationship with money and your relationship with God. I didn't say that. Jesus did. And it's like, <laughs> and some of you are getting nervous right now. I, 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 you know, it always is because, do you know why people get nervous when you, uh, money is a subject that comes up in church. They, they get nervous, they get uncomfortable and they start throwing up defense and shutting down because I'm closer to your heart than I've ever been. Because that's where your money is. That's where my money is. It's like they, they, those are the things that I, I love and I support and I want to be a part of. It's like, and, and money represents you. All of us. And, and yet, here's what you got to know. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. And, and he knows if he can get through the barrier of money, he will get to your heart. I, I remember uh, when Jacob, uh, our son, went to college and he had a car uh, that he'd had, actually we bought it for him. And, uh, and then as he went to college, he said, this isn't really a practical car. I'm gonna go ahead and sell it and get a different one. I said, all right, that's great. And I said, I want you to do it though. I want you to learn. I, I want you to advertise it. I want you to negotiate. I want you to you know, sign the title over and go to the bank. And I want you to do everything. He said, okay, okay. And I gave him some parameters on the price. And, uh, <laughs> and then, Jacob sold it and he got so excited. He said, dad, dad, I sold it. It's done, man. I got the money. It's good. I said, all right, that's awesome, man. Now transfer the money to my bank account. And he went, this is where it all broke down, by the way. <laughs> and, and he said, well, why don't I just wait until I get back from uh, break? I'll come home. I'll give it to you then. I said, all right. Okay. A couple of days later, I realized and found out that Jacob went to the Springs website and gave a tithe on that car, the amount that he sold it for, 10% to the Springs. And my first thought was, that was my money. <laughs> like, you're tithing on my money. <laughs> but then as I thought about it, I thought, well, you know what? He gets it. Man, if he gets this, it'll change his life. And, and he, he still gets it. And, you know, because once you understand that it's all God's. And God says, I, I want you to trust me. We're called to excel in generosity. We're called to excel. We're, we're called because generosity is not an amount. It's a mindset. It's, um, you know, generosity... I think so many of us struggle with it, but generosity doesn't flow from your bank account. It flows from your heart. And, and you know, truth is most of us struggle with generosity. Let me test it. You walk up to Publix. As you're about ready to walk in the entrance, you look and you see people with tables set up in jars and they're collecting, right? For their team or for their cause or whatever it is. What do you immediately think? Are you some of the people that think, you know what? I'll just go back out the entrance and I won't have to face them. <laughs> I'm just sharing some of the feelings I've had, okay? 
Or are you the type of person that says, you know what, if I, I'll wait for like a group of people to walk out so I can walk out behind them? Or do you think, you know what, I need to get some extra cash and drop it in the bucket? That, that's a battle. And it, it, it's because we, we don't want to give. We don't want to, you know, I don't know them. I don't know what they're going to do with that money. Why can't their parents buy the stuff for them? You know, I had to buy it for my kids. And you start all these different things. It, you know what? God just wants you to be generous. Get off your stingy head and just give a few bucks. That, that is the heart of generosity. Say, like, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to give it, man. You want me to be like you and you're a generous God. You know, we have these mindsets that limit God's activity in our life. You know, one of the biggest mindset is the not enough mindset. I just don't have enough. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to serve on a ministry team. I don't have enough time to get into a small group. I, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I got limited resources. You know what? I know people who have had uh, hundreds of dollars in their accounts and they feel like they don't have enough. I know people who have had thousands and ten thousands of dollars in their bank accounts and they feel like they don't have enough. I know people who have had millions of dollars in their bank account and they didn't feel like they would have enough. And you see, not enough is not an amount. It's a mindset. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth about excelling in their faith. And he says, uh, in 2 Corinthians 8, 7 and 8, he said, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. It, it, it just to give you a little backstory, Paul, the, the church at Corinth was ticked at Paul because Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to them and kind of straightened them out on a bunch of stuff that was going wrong in their church. And so they stopped giving to Paul. And so Paul comes in and he says, you know, I'm not commanding you to do this. I'm not demanding it. I'm just, I, I want to challenge you. I want you to, to you know, when, when he said, I'm testing how genuine your love is by what other churches have done. And he said, these churches at Macedonia, is what he was talking about earlier, they, they're, they live in a poverty, man. They're poor churches and they're, their worlds are in turmoil and, and chaos and and they gave out of their poverty more than I ever thought they would be able to. But the church of Corinth was a rich church. It was wealthy and they were given nothing. And so Paul says, here's the principle. He says, uh, you know, I, I want you to trust me. Paul always preferred to lay out principles rather than lay down rules. And he did that for two chapters. And here's what I want you to know. This whole journey in generosity, this is a spiritual journey. It's not a financial journey. That, that God wants you to trust him. Take the steps. You know, and that's why even Malachi, as you close out the Old Testament, Malachi, they, they were walking away from God's laws. They were, uh, they were giving God second best leftovers and uh, and they were walking away from their faith. Their marriages were failing. Everything was getting bad. And God sent this straight talking prophet named Malachi. And toward the end of the book of Malachi, as the Old Testament closed out, this is what Malachi 3.10 said. He said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in, in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me, put it to the test. Mal Malachi is saying, uh, God says, test me, try me. It's the only time in scripture that God says, test me. Because he knows if you'll test him and you'll find him faithful that you'll trust him more and your walk with God will grow. That's the whole purpose. It's not about money, it's about priority. And 
And I, I, I know that some people say, well, you know what, the tithe, the 10% of your income, I mean, that, first of all, that's Old Testament. Uh, that's Old Testament law. I live under the New Testament under grace. <laughs> Do you know that that doesn't make any sense because it's kind of like saying, you know, adultery, that was an Old Testament law. I, I live under the New Testament, so adultery is okay for me. Right? Or murder, murder is Old Testament law. Yeah, I'm under grace, New Testament. The, you know, and so it doesn't wash. It's a matter of saying, God, I want to trust you. God says, I, I want you to trust me. And, and here's what I know. Uh, some of you, you're, you're new to the faith. A lot of you have walked with God for years. And you've never tested him in this area. I, I want to challenge you to test him. Do a 90-day challenge. 90-day challenge where you say, you know what, I'm going to give, I'm going to trust God with a tithe and I'm going to, uh, for 90 days, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to, I'm going to bring that. And, and here's the thing, God said, test me. So at the end of 90 days, if you look and you go, you know what? I'm worse off financially than I was before and it didn't work. And you know what? I don't see God moving in my life. Would we'll come and tell us and we'll give you all your money back. God's the one that said, test me. This is the time. Say, God, I'm going to put you first. And if that's you, you say, I'm going to, I'm going to take a 90 day challenge. Just write 90 someplace on the connect card that we'll collect later on in a few minutes. 90. See, here's what I know. Most of you, uh, these are my sunglasses. These are my Ray-Bans. I've had them for about four years. Uh, you know, they're, I, I had them on a plane recently and I uh, had them in my, in my backpack and my, they fell out and I stepped on them. And uh, they, they look better now, but they were all bent up and broken. And I actually have a piece of metal here that just kind of sticks in my nose to hold them on. But, but, you know, here's the thing. I've had them for four years. These are my glasses. I'm okay. This is, this is where I'm at. And, yeah, one day I'll get some new glasses. But uh, and the truth is, I think this is how so many of us live. We look at life just through these same old glasses that we've always had. We're comfortable with this. But my grandkids have this. This is an Oculus, right? This is a virtual reality. And man, when they put this thing on, they step into a world that you and I can't see. They're interacting and they're looking around and they're making body movements and they're swinging at stuff. And, and they say, this is a different world. And, and if you see somebody with one of these on, you're looking at them going, they look dumb. What are they doing? They're moving and kicking and swinging. It doesn't make any sense. It's just make believe. God says, you can keep your me first world that you're comfortable with, or you can take my invitation into a God first world and you'll see reality from my point of view. You'll see things that you don't see right now. You'll experience what you've never experienced. He says, I want you to trust me. Don't just go to a church. Don't just, you know, come for an hour and leave. Trust me. Put him first. And for some of you, you've never done that. You've never, you know, you believed in your head that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, but it never made it to your heart to impact your daily life. And today, why don't you say, Jesus, yes. I'll follow you. I want you to be leader, first, savior in my life. You can begin a relationship with Jesus today, right here. Let's go to the Father in prayer. If you're here today and you say, I, wanna, I want Jesus to be the leader and savior of my life, tell him that. You can pray this prayer, not out loud, but between you and God. You say, dear Father, Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. 
to give me forgiveness for my past and a future in heaven one day. But today, a life that I have never experienced in following him as the leader. God, I trust you. And Jesus, you're my savior. Now teach me how to walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.